happy holidays. I'm Kristen Folletti, and thanks for joining us at News Desk on SiliconANGLE TV. As 2012 comes to a close, we're spending some time reflecting on the stories this year that have had a significant impact in the tech world. Join us once again to look at the year in review and to provide his analysis on the future of big data is Wikibon analyst Jeff Kelly. Welcome back to the program, and thanks again for joining us, Jeff. Well, thanks for having me, Kristen. Good to be here. We saw a lot of buzz surrounding big data and the election earlier this year, and big data even got its own book called The Human Face of Big Data. In an interview on November 20th, you spoke on how the idea of big data in the mainstream loses the formal term big data and is often presented to the public as analytics or something else. Should we be concerned with the rebranding of big data, or do you see this as a positive sign? Uh, no, I wouldn't be concerned. I think, in fact, it may be a positive sign uh, for a number of reasons. Namely, um, you know, one of the issues when you're talking about big data in, in a uh, kind of a mainstream sense uh, is that people who are not in the industry tend to think big data, kind of big brother, a lot of privacy concerns, things like that. So uh, potentially, you know, not using that particular term uh, might actually be a positive just in terms of the uh, kind of the connotations and the ideas it brings to mind. Um, but I think further, you know, we're going to see that term at some point really not be uh, applicable anymore because really from pretty much everything's going to be big data. When you talk about data, it's all going to be large volume of data, you know, multiple varieties of data coming from multiple sources, uh, coming in, uh, you know, very quickly, high velocity. So um, I think big data is just going to become the norm uh, and we can actually drop the big from that term and it's really just going to be data uh, and the uh, analytics and uh, services that are provided on top of it. In sharing some of his predictions about the evolution of big data in 2013, SiliconANGLE founding editor Mark Risen Hopkins said he expects to see an upswing in data journalism, specifically saying there's a literacy process that's going to need to take place, data science is not infallible, and is subject to some biases if it's not handled properly. What's your take on data journalism, and how do you think we'll see it develop over the next few years? Well, I certainly think you're going to see a, a, an uptick in more data-intensive or data-focused journalism. Uh, right now, I mean, the, the Guardian in the UK is one of uh, one uh, media outlet that's uh, kind of ahead of ahead of most. Uh, I'd say, along with the New York Times, in terms of uh, bringing data science and analytics to bear on their on their reporting. Um, you know, there there's a couple couple things to consider, however, in terms of expanding that to to more organizations, to more news organizations, and that is. Uh, one, as you mentioned, the uh, the skills needed to um, analyze and parse data, uh, you know, that are not necessarily uh, part of the average journalist's uh, tool set right now. So there is going to have there is going to be a learning curve there. Uh, the other issue is, you know, especially when it comes to uh, you know, journalism focused on kind of uh, you know public policy issues. A lot of the data concern here is housed, uh, you know, within government agencies and. Uh, you know, government agencies at this point, while some are certainly advanced in their data management practices, others are not. Um, so, you know, traditionally, uh, you know, especially on the local level, when you're doing local news stories, um, you know, you'll, it's not uncommon for, for journalists to, to sit with boxes of documents and files and go through them, you know, by hand <laughs> and to kind of tabulate data. Um, that, obviously, you know, if, if, if data is not uh, in a format where it can be analyzed using technology, then obviously that's going to stall or uh, slow down the process of uh, kind of expanding data-focused journalism. So uh, on the one hand, certainly journalists need to improve their skills. On the other hand, uh, the data sources, the data they want to analyze, uh, needs to kind of be put in a format that it, that it can be analyzed. Um, and that, that's going to take some time, particularly in uh, you know, government agencies and particularly on the state and local level. So then do you think we'll start to see more data scientists in the newsroom? Um, you know, I think so. I, I don't know if you'll, they'll use that term necessarily. Um, you know, I think, you know, not unlike how kind of the term big data, you know, is going to become uh, a thing of the past when everything is big data. I think um, as data science and analytics is, is applied more and more to to uh, to journalism, it's just going to become a standard way of, of, of reporting. Um, so you might not see the term data scientist, uh, you know, particularly uh, mentioned. Uh, or, or used in the newsroom, um, but I think you know some of those skills will be a, a prerequisite for a lot of journalists. Um, you know, in addition to some of the more specialized uh, journalists that focus specifically on understanding 
database technology and, and getting the most uh, understanding how to really analyze data at a very uh, granular level, which there are already some, some uh, journalists in newsrooms around the country that, that, uh, you know, that operate in that database uh, based journalists uh, to kind of help the rest of the newsroom, but those skills are going to expand to to your, your more average journalists uh, as the years progress. On November 20th, we spoke with you about Europe's proposed Right to Be Forgotten Act, an act that has been the subject of intense debate with many people arguing it's simply not practical in the age of the internet for any data to be reliably expunged from history. Can you briefly summarize the act for us and explain the implications such an act would have for big data? Well, the idea is simply is that you know a consumer, a, a citizen uh, in the European Union should have the ability to um, erase essentially their digital footprint. Uh, the problem is it's not practical. There's really no practical way to do that. Uh, data, you know, data points that make up a person's uh, you know overall profile uh, are, are housed in disparate sources uh, among disparate organizations and enterprises. Um, you know, and in many cases, uh, wittingly or not, uh, citizens have given their consent to have this data collected. Um, you know, they may not even realize it. It's often buried in you know fine print and user agreements and things for for social networking and social media sites. Um, but in fact, you know, they've essentially consented to to allow their data to to, to live beyond their uh, you know beyond their control. So. Practically speaking, um, it's going to be very. It would be very difficult to implement such a such a policy. Um, and you know, frankly, I think people are starting to, to understand that. Really, it's it's not only is it not possible, but there are actually benefits when your uh, personal data is is uh, is out there, and in the term, in not just in the, in the way that you know uh, companies advertise to you in a more personalized way, but uh, in other services that they can bring to bear uh, to improve you know the, the user experience. Uh, with various companies and organizations. In your opinion, do you think people want to be forgotten, or has a data footprint sort of become a part of us all? Well, as I said, I think it's it's mixed right now. I think, you know, I think the new, the, the, you know, the, the so-called millennial generation. I don't think they even really think about it too much. Um, you know, I think they're just it's just part of their lives. You know, sharing their data with uh, their friends, um, you know, their social networks and beyond. Uh, you know, I think. Older generations, uh, you know, my generation included, you know, that acceptance is not as widespread. Um, but I think as the years progress, it's, it's just going to become part of, of uh, you know, our mainstream uh, ex experience online. Can you discuss the differences between commercial uses versus real-world applications of big data? Sure. So, you know, I think there are. Certainly, there, there are commercial uh, opportunities for organizations to to exploit big data. Um, you know, whether it's in retail, um, uh, marketing, trying to uh, better target and segment uh, customers for marketing campaigns to drive uh, more revenue. Um, you know, if it's financial services, looking to analyze uh, uh, financial and uh, stock data, for instance, to make better um, uh, you know asset purchases and and sales. Uh, whatever it might be, uh, you know, there's, there's any number of commercial use cases. I think when it comes to more socially focused use cases, um, you know, that's when you're starting to talk about what the government can do uh, to improve their services, whether it's you know, make, uh, make it easier to interact with various government agencies uh, by, by um, personalizing service online based on uh, analyzing user data. Uh, we all know, we've all you know, been through the, uh, the experience of waiting at the DMV. Well, you know that's never fun. If you could, you know, do a lot of those types of activities online and make it easier to do, do it via smartphone, um, and to do it in a personalized way, um, you know, those are some opportunities there for uh, government agencies and social services to to make their interaction with the public uh, a little bit easier and uh, more beneficial. We spoke this year about Google being under scrutiny for promoting its own services and search results. How could big data be applied to an open, non-commercial search engine? And would that be better, in your opinion? Well, I mean, I think, think about it as a user. If you were, you know, going to uh, Google or any other search engine, uh, you know, assuming you don't have a, a specific agenda, you're, you're looking for the best results to your search. Uh, you're not interested necessarily in having uh, the search engine or the operator of the search engine deliver results that are more beneficial to them. Uh, so it's, I think it certainly can be useful uh, to have a kind of 
uh, content neutral or uh, you know a, a neutral approach to uh, returning search results based on just what the data uh, is telling them. Um, on the other hand, you can understand why someone like Google would want to uh, promote their own services within uh, their search engine. Um, so the question is balanced there, and you know, frankly, it's a, it's probably a legal question as well. Um, you know, there are currently uh, legal cases outstanding that are uh, going to determine this question: is it is it okay uh, t for Google to you know promote their own services higher up in search results when organically perhaps they wouldn't appear there? Um, and if so, to what level? Um, so you know, you could argue on the one hand that you know, yeah, a perfectly neutral search engine that you know that where the the analytics and the data behind the uh, the search algorithms is 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 100% neutral and just delivers the best results best on what the data is telling them. Uh, certainly could be useful for for a lot of people. But on the other hand, you know, when Google, a lot of people, you know, are involved or are in the Google ecosystem. They use Gmail. They use uh, Google Plus. Or not not that many using Google Plus, but it's, it's increasing a little bit. Uh, you know, Google uh, Drive for for documents and other things. So. If you're one of those users, perhaps you prefer your results to be a little bit biased towards Google because that's part of your ecosystem. So um, you know, it can go either way. Um, it'll be interesting to see how these court cases play out, um, and that will really determine uh, where that where this issue goes. We found out earlier this year that Facebook has been internally allowing a select number of marketers to see data that divulged information about the brand's consumers, including interests such as their favorite bands or TV shows. In your opinion, should social media sites like Facebook and Twitter be able to charge for access to such user data, or should it be public property? Uh, well, that's a, that's a good question. I think they sh I think they should be uh, able to charge for it because you know they're providing a service to consumers, uh, and in exchange, the consumers are, are essentially uh, giving them their data. Now, the problem is some consumers don't realize they're doing that. Um, you know, I don't think there's a problem with you know Facebook doing that. In fact, it's critical to their success going forward. I mean, part of the uh, reason for the uh, botched IPO and the significantly lower stock price was all around well, how is Facebook going to monetize all this user data? And in, in order to do that, they've got to uh, essentially create services that are attractive to uh, advertisers based on on the data they collected from users. I mean, there's really no way around that. So you know, in that sense, they're, they're selling data. So they're selling personal data uh, again. But, but it's important to note that not personal in the sense that it's you know they know necessarily that it's you know, Jeff Kelly's Facebook feed and uh, here's here's all the personal information about him, his age, his spouse, his, uh, how many children he has, where he lives, all that kind of information. It's it's uh, anonymized aggregate personal data uh... To, to to allow uh, advertisers to kind of segment users and, and target the types of users they want to uh, target with their advertising and marketing campaigns um, so in that sense yeah i think it's perfectly reasonable and uh... for facebook and others to do that and i don't see any way around doing that if they want to uh, be financially successful and viable what kinds of issues can a data footprint have on our privacy well i mean i think you know we've all seen uh, instances where someone has posted posted a uh, you know picture on a, on a social network or like Facebook or Twitter or wherever, um, or maybe they're you know maybe they're in college and a few years down the road they're not so proud of that picture, <laughs> and uh, you know a potential employer could get that because you know guess what that picture is not going anywhere that's part of your digital footprint, um, and even if you take it down from Facebook or wherever maybe you know it it could have been copied by someone else it could be posted elsewhere, um, so you know you really need to be careful what you post online because your digital footprint really is permanent. Jeff, I'm going to stop you again so that we can continue more on this discussion tomorrow, but thank you once again for your time. My pleasure. So for part three of our Holiday News Desk segment with Wikibon analyst Jeff Kelly, be sure to join us tomorrow at News Desk on SiliconANGLE TV.